this kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Good evening. One group at a time. Good evening. I call this Iowa City Community School Board meeting on Tuesday, November 13th, 2018 to order. My name is Janet Godwin and I want to thank those in the audience, those watching on YouTube and those following on Twitter for joining us tonight. I'll start by introducing those at the table with me. At my right, Superintendent Steve Murley, Directors Phil Hemingway, Lori Rotland, Paul Ressler, Sean Eystone, J.P. Clausen, and Kim Colvin, Recording Secretary. The public is reminded that if they wish to speak, they need to complete a speaker form found at the table in the lobby and turn it in. During community comment, persons may speak to the board about topics relevant to the district. All community comment directed at non-agenda items and agenda items shall take place at the beginning of the meeting during the community comment section of the agenda. And with that, we will move into our student representative updates. First up, we have City High, Lottie Goodall, and Naomi Maurice. Um, hello, my name is Lottie. I'm Naomi. Um, first off, we can just give you a quick overview of what we're doing in Student Senate right now. Um, we are busy planning for the Powder Puff Volleyball Tournament, our annual drive for the Crisis Center um, last year, um, which usually raises about several thousand dollars um, and the winter formal. Um, we've also taken up the issue of the um, kind of overinflated price of graduation robes and are trying to come up with a financially viable solution for that for students um, that is not like $45, $50. Um, our art department was invited to paint a mural um, on the American Legion Road of an American flag, um, and they've done so. Mm -hmm. The drama department was invited to perform at the Iowa Thespian Festival this past weekend um, for their series of one-act comedy plays. Um, that was a really big honor for them. Um, our girls cross-country team hosted their 14th annual Run for Relief program uh, run, sorry, on November 3rd, which raised over $5.5,000. Uh, for a local nonprofit, I See Compassion, uh, which helps immigrants and refugees in the community by providing free legal services, language classes, support groups, and everything like that. Uh, City High's newspaper, The Little Hawk, was named All Iowa News Team of the Year by the Iowa High School Press Association. Um, and in a single advisory period, uh, City High's Dance Marathon raised over $700. Um, which is, and they're gearing up for their dance, which is going to be in mid January. Uh, uh, for your sports update, the girls and boys cross country team both placed fifth at the NBC district tournament uh, a couple weeks ago and qualified their top runners, freshman Roan Bolter and senior Yasser Hassan for the state tournament and they both did really well there. Um, our girls swimming team placed seventh at state, uh, which is their third top ten finish in the last 50 years. They qualified all three of their relay, all three of their relay teams, um, which was really exciting. And the volleyball team advanced to the regional finals, uh, ending on a strong note against Cedar Rapids Jefferson. Um, and then we are very excited to be here tonight with our choir, band, and orchestra students. I think we have 20 of them mm -hmm. um, who have made it through the rigorous audition process to be accepted into Ball State. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. Um, I drive American Legion Road all the time. I guess I'm, I haven't seen you. Whereabouts is the flag that you guys painted, do you know? Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, <laughs> I do know that uh, the information is on the student newspaper website, okay. but I couldn't give you it off the top of my head. Well, it's on the back of the building. My daughter was in art club, and the first thing that so it's on the back, so it's part of the back of the American Legion. Oh, it's the American Legion on American Legion. Yes, on yeah. American Legion. Okay, there yeah. it is. Uh, next time I was on American Legion Road, I was going to be looking for the flag, so thank, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Have a great night. Um, next up, uh, West High and Anjali Huen. Not here. Um, we'll go to uh, Liberty High, Kate Randall and Ryan Eystone. Good evening. Um, Kate was not able to be here. Um, my name is Ryan Eystone and I am the Liberty High School representative. Tonight I will be giving you an update of what Liberty has done in the past month. Um, this week students at all three high schools are wrapping up final exams. A huge amount of academic work has gone into the first trimester and students at Liberty are working hard to finish academically strong. We will be highlighting honor roll students at Liberty for 
from first trimester after grades are in. Um, I would also like to share news from our extracurricular activities. Tonight we are joined by our Liberty Allstate musicians. We are very proud of their accomplishments and they will be sharing those with you shortly. This past weekend, Liberty Lightning Theater put on their production of Clue on stage. Many, many thought the show was amazing, funny, and also had a twisting plot. With this great success, we can't wait for our spring musical. The football teams have finished their season. Looking back, the opening of the stadium, home games, and homecoming provided a great opportunity to include the community in Liberty events. Finally, as we enter the winter season, Liberty is looking for ways to give back to the community and also provide for our Liberty community members who are in need. Student Senate is currently hosting our clothing drive. The drive will run from the 5th through the 15th of November, and we will be donating the clothes raised, as well as working on stocking our in-house pantry of items for Liberty students in need. Throughout, through another giving campaign, our male teachers are participating in No Shave November this month. Participating teachers are raising money for the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. So far, two groups of teachers are battling it out, but this race could take an interesting turn. We will just have to wait and see. Thank you for your time, and hopefully next month we will have lots of things to be shared, such as the amount raised. Wonderful, thank you. Um, West High, Angeli Huen. Hello, uh, my name is Anjali Huen, and I am the West High Student Senate Community Engagement Coordinator. Um, since the October 9th school board meeting, West High has been abuzz with a variety of activities. Um, West held its homecoming in its newly designed home with its newly designed homecoming court on October 13th. This event, taking place in West New Gym for the first time, was a great success. Um, as you're about to see, many students fit, found great success while auditioning for the Allstate Music Festival um, on October 22nd. 88 West High musicians auditioned for this prestigious group. Out of these students, an astounding 45 were selected as Allstaters, and five were selected as Allstaters. Um, Student Senate held its second annual Fall Fun Fest uh, on October 26th, a community event featuring a variety of fun ways for students of all ages and their families to come out and enjoy the fall weather, such as um, bouncy houses, food trucks, and a haunted house run by our very own Peter West. Um, just last week, the West Side Story newspapers won a pacemaker award for uh, while attending the National Chicago Journalism Conference. This national award is only granted to a handful of students across the country and is considered a Pulitzer of high school journalism. They were also once again recognized as one of the top five news teams in the state. Um, West Trojan Epic, Epic Yearbook staff was also named Iowa Yearbook of the Year for the second year in a row. Um, focusing on athletics, our varsity football team finished their season in the quarterfinal playoff uh, with a 9-2 record. Our undefeated girls swim team also placed sixth in the state with several stellar performances from individual girls swimmers. Um, both the boys and girls cross country teams placed second at their respective state qualifier championship uh, races and both individual champions for these qualifying races were West students. Um, speech and debate students have also had a successful season thus far with individual students performing well at competitions uh, around Iowa such as in Bettendorf and Des Moines. Um, this past Saturday, two students organized West's fifth annual music playathon, um, raising nearly $1,000 for the music auxiliary. Um, this event consisted of performances from a variety of talented students across the school and was a great community bonding event. Um, upcoming events for West include a Sykes Diversity Dinner um, this Thursday, as well as our fall play, Miracle on 34th Street, that will be performed at the end of November and beginning of December. We look forward to continuing our tradition of excellence. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you. So I know we're very excited about um, the Allstate Music Reception. We're going to sneak in, though, um, a classroom cash check award. Um, looking for Susan. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm skipping it. It's ICEA Brady. I'm so sorry. I was so focused on not missing the classroom uh, cash that I forgot. <laughs> that you are next. That's all right. It's hard to compete with the Allstate Music <laughs> I agree. Uh, President Godwin and uh, Director Superintendent Murley, thank you. Um, I just want to extend my congratulations to the Allstate musicians and their, uh, their families. They are unbelievable musicians and uh, even, you know, as a secondary teacher, I can tell you they're even better people. So uh, there's a lot of hard work and dedication that goes into that. They're, uh, in all of the teachers in the district, K-12, that do music and fine arts should be uh, congratulated as well. So it's sort of an exciting night. Um, 
you know, to be here. I'd also like to thank our core leadership team and our teacher leadership program. Ben Mosier, Carolyn uh, Sainar, and Anna Austin are doing an amazing job. And JP, you were in the early years of the teacher leadership program on sort of the, the oversight committee. And uh, I'd encourage you uh, to schedule a time to talk with them. Uh, I think that it'd be really, really interesting for you to hear what they have to say and, the wor and to, to learn about the work that they're, uh, that they're doing. So um, my last little shout out is conferences. Just as a reminder to families, it's elementary conferences season. And uh, boy, our elementary teachers work incredibly hard. I and mean, it's, it it's got to feel like Groundhog Day uh, for them. So Thursday night, they have conferences. They come back in, start at 7 o'clock with conferences all day on uh, Friday. So uh, huge thanks to them. And I, I do teach at Liberty, and I am doing No Shave November, as you might have noticed. <laughs> the, the rumor is, is that if you're on the winning team, they're, they're going to shave a lightning bolt in your, your beard. So JP, in a sign of uh, solidarity, I'm sure you'll do that with me if I'm on the winning team. So thank on it. Okay. Yeah. Did you all start clean, or did some of it looks like you had a head start? I, no, no, this is a clean start, although some people you could tell were trying to sneak away. Well, okay. they were. They were no, this is, this is legit, so we'll see how it goes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brady. Okay, now uh, Hills Bank Classroom Cash presentation. Thank one of our most influential partners, Hills Bank, and their program, Classroom Cash. It is a program that we benefit from twice a year, and um, some of the support from this program goes to some of the most innovative things that we are doing in our, in our schools. This year, just so you know, um, this fund will help on our Lexia and Dreambox rollout that the district has asked us to partner and uh, just a way to help close that learning gap. And so just an exciting project going on. But I would like to introduce two representatives from Hills Bank with us tonight, Tom Heinrich and Kenzie Hines. Yes, so, uh, like Susan said, Classroom Cash is a program that we have at the bank. Um, Long story short, we allow customers to pick a school district of their choice, and a portion of all their debit card spending goes to that school district. It doesn't cost the customer anything at all. It's just a way for us to help give back to the community. Um, started in 2004, since then we've earned over a million dollars that we've given to school districts, and over 400,000 of that has gone right here to the Iowa City Community School District. Um, it's very easy if anyone in the crowd has a little bit. <laughs> um, you just go to hillsbank.com slash classroom cash. You can pick your school district of your choice. It's just a short form. Um, and yeah, it's just a program we're really proud of. Mm -hmm. Yes. No further ado, we will move into our all-state music reception. And who will be leading that? Hello, great. Um, is this okay? Hi everyone, uh, my name is John Welch. I'm the orchestra director at uh, West High School and I'm also the uh, new performance music coordinator for the district. So uh, I'm here tonight to honor the students of the Iowa schools, Iowa City schools that have been selected to participate in the 2018 Iowa High School Music Association's All-State Band, Chorus, and Orchestra. This organization represents the nearly 300 high schools across the state and the students that are selected these ensembles represent the finest high school musicians in Iowa. The students you see tonight have spent countless hours of practice with their directors and private teachers in preparation for the festival this week in Ames. The students will travel to Iowa State University for two uh, days of rehearsal and a concert this Saturday evening. 
I am proud to say that the Iowa City Schools has once again placed in the largest amount of students into these ensembles across the state. Uh, before we introduce these students, I'd like to say just a, a few special thanks. Uh, first off, to the Music Auxiliary for their financial support of registration hotel and expenses for the weekend. Um, also to the Iowa City Community uh, School District and the board for your continued support of our music programs from grades K through 12. Your commitment to our programs is a commitment to an excellent education for our students. And, um, and most of all, thanks to the parents of all of our students. These accomplishments ulti ultimately come from you and your support of your child's music education. Thank you for all that you do. So we're gonna introduce the directors and they're gonna come in and read off the names of the students um, that were accepted. And uh, we'll begin with the City High Choir, and Mr. Hagee. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, as John mentioned, my name is Tyler Hagee, uh, one of the choir directors at City High. Uh, we had five students this year uh, selected, so they are Jeremiah Brook, bass two, Fong Nguyen, bass two, Elias Perez, tenor one, Lucy Rude, soprano one, alternate, and Lauren Rudy, soprano one. And next we're gonna bring out uh, Mr. Enriquez from uh, West High Choir. Hello everybody, uh, I'm Luigi Enriquez from West High School. Uh, this year we have 12 kids heading to Allstate. Uh, they are Carissa Burkhardt, soprano one, Matthew Cup, the alternate tenor two, Niti Despande, alto one, Sam Dolensek, tenor one, Julia Fink, soprano one. We have Jack Hinman, bass two, Maggie McLaughlin, soprano two, Margaret Penning, alto one, Lucy Poliak, alto two, McKenna Proud on tenor one, Jenna Wang on alto one and Ty Waters on bass two. Thanks so much. Next we have um, Megan Stuckey from City High Orchestra. Hi, good evening. I have the pleasure of introducing our orchestra students that made it into Allstate for City High School. We have Ruby Anderson, Oliver Bastian, John Bounds, Phoebe Chapnick Sorokin, Maya Jansen, Daphne Noop, Oshin Leopold, Ruth Meehan, Oliver Myers, Oriana Ross, Annalise Rummelhart, Kent Zidan, and Kaya Zidan. And next from Liberty High Orchestras, we have uh, Miss, Mrs. Annie Savage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're very proud to say that at Liberty High School this year, we increased our orchestra participation in all state by 100%. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really proud of these guys, Cole Hansen and Garrett Raggi. Great job, guys. And from West High, you have me, John Welch, and have our students come on out. Um, and this year, uh, we had uh, Maul Bhagavati, um, Paris Pasuk, Mati Brandenburg, Andrew Burgess, Sophia Chen, Julian Cook, Liam Edberg, Perry Haradia, Mohan Kumar, Kevin Liu, Lily Mang, Ruth Miller, Anna Moses as alternate, uh, Madeline Ohl, Yulong Chow, Elizabeth Wan, Joseph Wan, Emily Shen, uh, Teju Yoon, and William Zhang, uh, alternate on cello. <laughs> and next, we have the City High Band and Dr. McReynolds. Good, e good evening. They took my script. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, 
uh, I'm very, very proud of all of these students from all of the schools. And I always try to make a point of saying thank you to all of the private teachers who do really the heavy lifting for getting all of our students prepared. So parents and students, when you see your teachers next, please say a big, big thank you. They brought you here. City High Band tonight is being, oh, <laughs> being re represented by Elliot Beauchamp, her second year on bassoon. She's a, she's a junior. Uh, Ryan Carter on trombone and orchestra. This is Ryan's second year. Maggie Kramer's an alternate on trombone. Maggie's a senior, I made Allstate last year. Josh Fletcher on trumpet. Josh is a senior. This is his first Allstate appearance. Laura Freestad on clarinet. This is Laura's first, second year in Allstate. She's a sophomore. Adam Holmes on bassoon, another sophomore, his second year in Allstate. Um, Quinn Koppelman, who is a senior. This is his third year on bass clarinet at Allstate. Justine Rushley krasowski an alternate on alto sax, and Justine's a sophomore. Colby Schneblin, his second appearance at Allstate. Colby is a junior on trombone. Rocio Stasco on clarinet. This is Rocio's third Allstate, I believe, correct? All right, she's a senior. Um, Michael Takahashi on percussion. Michael's a sophomore. This is his first, uh, first appearance at Allstate. And Renee Thomas on French horn. This is Renee's first Allstate. She's a senior. Congratulations to all. Oh, and Mr. Otmar was with him as well. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, and then um, from Liberty High Band, uh, Mr. Arp. Hello. Uh, Liberty High School, my name is Ryan Arp. Uh, we had two kids accepted to Allstate. Um, Megan Uden, uh, first alternate on clarinet. She couldn't be here tonight because she has a uh, varsity basketball practice but with us tonight is Elizabeth Wagner a flute player so congratulations <laughs> and from West High Band we have Mr. Med Good evening, I'm Rob Med from West High. Rich Med is out organizing the troops out here. So uh, our students from the West High Band recognized at Allstate uh, this year. Emily Buck, a three-year Allstater on bassoon. Come on, Emily. Ethan Buck, a first-year Allstater on alto sax. Timothy Quay, a second-year Allstater sophomore on clarinet. Rachel Ding, a senior uh, Allstater on flute. Thomas Duong, a third year uh, Allstater on percussion. Emma Gelbach, a four year Allstater on clarinet. Oh. Luke Hackman is an alternate Allstater on oboe. Vivian Ho is a second year Allstater on flute. Chris Kim, a second year Allstater on alto sax. Jim Lee, first year Allstater on oboe. Nina Meng is a second year Allstater on clarinet. James Mons, a three year Allstater senior trumpet player. Lillian Montilla could not be with us tonight as she is a first year Allstater on flute. Next we have uh, Yang Tian Shengguan, who is a three-year All-Stater as a senior. Uh, also not able to be with us tonight, Daniel Song is an alternate on alto sax. On uh, Barry Sax, a senior three-year All-Stater, Nick Stilwell. An alternate on trombone, Barry Vihill. First year freshman All-Stater on clarinet, Nathan Wee. And a three year All-Stater junior, Chen Yu Wu. 
These are our All-Staters from West High School Band. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for coming and sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we'll move into community comment. Uh, first up for community comment is Jonathan Landon. And following Jonathan will be Margarita Balthazar. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Um, I, I'll be brief. Um, I'm one of the families that was impacted by the 2016, uh, or my children, of the 2016 boundary change from Horn to Weber. Uh, and now I understand the board's considering a proposal that would involve moving um, the families in our neighborhood back to Horn just two years later. Um, and I know you've received a lot of feedback from people in our, my neighborhood about this, um, as well as the Plainview neighborhood, and, and I've provided some written feedback. Now, it's my understanding the board's considering a proposal that might allow families affected by the Horn to Weber move in 2016 to be grandfathered into Weber. I, I don't know if that's real or not. Uh, it's, it's what I've heard. Uh, and I just have one comment then to make on, on that regard, is that I'd request that um, all the children of affected families be included in the grandfathering. Otherwise, we're kind of left with the Hobbesian choice of letting the three kids stay and my preschooler go to a different school. Um, my, I have no idea how the transportation would work in that situation as well as the, um, just kind of the, the, the shared experiences. I'm an attorney by trade. My best evidence is this little note that I don't think I could actually read without crying because my seven-year-old second grader wrote it not prompted at all uh, but it says dear dear family this is mom dad and me we went through some hard something since moving to Weber but you made it I love that we can all be a part of it I know we can get Mason to Weber so uh, yeah. just uh, appreciate your consideration on trying to keep the families together uh, as you consider it's hard hard job I, I don't envy your the work that you have to do um, just please bear in mind some of these other smaller consequences that are, that are so thank you for your time. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Margarita Baltasar, followed by Mazahir Sully. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por dedicarnos un minuto de Thank su atención. Mi nombre es Margarita Baltasar. Es My name is Margarita Baltasar. Soy presidenta de la Asociación de Forestview. I am the president of the Association of Forest View. Estoy aquí para representar a las personas de Forestview. So I'm here representing the residents of Forestview. En primera quiero decir que Ah, sabemos que iba a haber cambios de las escuelas. First of all, uh, I would like to mention that we heard that there were going to be changes in the schools. Y hemos escuchado que nos van a dejar forest men en el mismo lugar. And uh, we have heard that, um, that you're going to leave us, the forest men are going to leave us in the same place. Agradecemos eso que están haciendo porque... And we are thankful that you are doing that. Porque estábamos tan preocupados por ese cambio because we, we were worrying about that change pero si nos van a dejar en el mismo lugar está perfecto para nosotros y para nuestros hijos so but if you're going to leave us in the same place uh, we welcome that it is very perfect for our children 
Ayer estuve platicando con varios papás y varios niños. Uh, yesterday I was having conversation with uh, 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 several uh, parents uh, and children. Muchos de ellos no sabían de este proyecto. Uh, many of them did not know of this project. Y estaban preocupados. And they started to worry. Pero les dijimos que por el momento el distrito ha tomado la decisión de dejarnos en el mismo lugar. But we mentioned to them that at the moment we know that the district is um, planning on leaving us uh, in the same place. Entonces se han quedado un poquito más tranquilos. So now they are a little bit relaxed. Mm -hmm. Entonces yo agradezco esto y que por favor nos tomen en cuenta que no queremos cambios por el momento. So we I would like to express our uh, gratitude on your behalf and also the please leave us where we are and that we do not want any changes. Queremos cosas buenas para nuestros hijos, pero no queremos que sufran cambios tan drásticos. We want uh, the good things for our children and we don't want to see them face uh, drastic changes. Y en nombre de todo por esvio, gracias por su atención de dejarnos en el mismo mismo lugar. And in the name of uh, Forest View, I'd like to express my, our thanks and uh, thank you for leaving us in the same um, district or place. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you so much. Ozzy here, followed by Charlie Eastham. Hi, good evening. Hello. Good evening. Thank you for your service, as always. You guys are doing a good job. Uh, my name is Mazahar Saleh. I'm a community organizer at the Center for Worker Justice. Uh, I came today with uh, Margarita and because you know we had a meeting on the 1st of November with Forest View Tenant Association. And the Tenant Association consists of like almost uh, uh, 50 uh, families uh, where they came on the meeting. Most of them came, of course, not all of them. But we talked about the uh, horseman being there is proposal to be transferred or already been transferred to the Lincoln. You know, nothing against Lincoln because my kids go to Lincoln. It's very good school. I love it. But you know, the parents just uh, have a concern that uh, their kids, uh, you know, people of color going to Horseman for a long time, they build like really good relationship with the teachers. And the teachers start knowing their cultures, start knowing like how to deal with those people, how to deal with parents. It's really, you know, I know that you guys going, uh, uh, doing like some kind of classes for teacher about cultures and about like uh, assumptions and all these kind of things. In this case, I guess horse, my, uh, for horseman teachers, they already like had that through the experience and like hand on with people and first hand experience with the children for a long time. And they really built a very good relationship. Everyone in the meeting saying that our kids did very good with the teacher. They like the teacher. The teacher understand all the different cultures. They start knowing their holidays. They start knowing like how to deal with the parent. That's why they would love to stay at, you know, Horseman. Lincoln is very good. They say Lincoln is very good school. We know that, but we would like to stay there just because we get used to it. I'm um, just bringing their voice. We even we started like some kind of petition for the people who did not come to the meeting. All the people who come to the meeting, I guess, uh, what her name? Uh, they give permission to Margarita, Margarita to come here and talk about them. But we even start like some kind of petition for the people. Charlie will talk, talk to you about that. But this is what is happening right now. And this is about first view. And I have something from my own. I just want to bring that for the voluntary transfer. I really will encourage you. Uh, I know that, I know what the goal of this. I understand the passion about it and why you want to do it. But some kids of color, the, 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 the kids of color who are already at, in schools that don't have kids of color, just like my own. My kids go to Lincoln. Lincoln is not my uh, home school. My home school is Shimmick. Uh, my kids doesn't go there, but you know, I think they want to continue there if I already transport my kids myself, if I already doing that, and I'm, I'm working toward the goal that you guys are doing it, please, leave them. You know, give that like really some kind of consideration to leave those kids of color at the school that have like, high, like white people more and less uh, diversity, because I think my kids are bringing some diversity to Lincoln. And that's what the school goal. And thank you for service again. Thank you. Thank you. 
Charlie. Good evening, my name is Charlie Easttown. I live at 953 Canton Street in Iowa City. Uh, I'm a member of the board of the uh, Center for Worker Justice, and I've been involved with the uh, Forest View Tenants Association of Forest View Parents, including their interest in where their kids are going to school for the next few years. And uh, Margarita uh, earlier uh, talked with you, and she asked me to just to uh, read the petition that they uh, recently passed uh, out to <coughs> parents in the Forest View neighborhood. This is a petition to stop school re redistricting action. We Forest View parents of elementary age children are concerned about the potential action to redistrict Forest View. We believe that our children have established relationships with Horace Mann teachers and staff. We parents are very happy with the relationship and culture that has been created at Horace Mann and fear that our children's movement to a different school would be detrimental to their development. By creating this petition, we the Forest View parents state our disagreement with any actions to remove our children from Horace Mann. We kindly suggest that the Iowa City School District take this into consideration when making your decisions about redistricting. The petition has been signed by 11 parents uh, uh, who have 21 students in the uh, district. So I'll leave this with uh, Kim. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, that uh, concludes community comment. Um, we'll move into uh, the agenda approval. Is there a motion to approve our agenda this evening? So moved. Second. Kim, we're ready to vote. Online voting is open. <laughs> all votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Um, so the consent agenda, uh, I'm going to ask that we pull Appendix 9, item, uh, item 10, Appendix 9. Any others? Bill, do you want to give an update on bills? Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, two-week period, we had uh, $6.6 .6 million worth of uh, Expenditures, uh, 4.1 million of it was uh, go bond funding. And uh, from uh, the beginning to date, uh, no, uh, September 30th, uh, we've spent uh, $19,998,000 of the uh, original go bond and money of 1.9 million, or 190 million, excuse me. Um, not, and this four million is on top of that. So we have a lot of projects going on and there's a lot of money uh, going to the uh, construction projects at this time. Thank you, and, Phil. Uh, and everything. I had some questions on some uh, uh, payments for security staff and coming out of the general fund and I had those questions answered, so thank you. Good, thank you. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda minus item 10? So moved. Second. Kim, ready to vote? Online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. Thank you. Dwayne. All right, thank you. Well, the architects have been working hard on City High. They've met with the staff many times, starting to develop some pretty good plans, but we're into what we call design development. And they put together a nice little video. I thought it was worthy of showing you and the public this evening. So, and We'll get it going here, and I may pause it a couple times just to put in some stuff. Obviously, this is the front, existing front of City High, and we're moving from the north end to the south end. That greenhouse there, if some of you are sure familiar with that. There. Uh, some of you had asked early on uh, in the design process about handicap accessibility. To the building and and we assured you that there'd be a ramp but you can see the extent of that ramp and it's be well landscaped uh, and we'll provide one of several ways to get into the building the others on the south entrance but of course uh, there is an entrance to the patio this way so if there's an outside function you'll be able to get there 
Uh, the other concerns we had early on were the, the visual parts of the working parts of the building. So that big, this uh, black gate that you see right here actually covers the refrigeration units that are required for the city height kitchen. Uh, and so that, you know, we've sheltered that. The larger gate here, which, in, which we have since changed, will be at the height of this wall right here. There's a double gate, mechanical operated. That's where the food service trucks will back into a dock. So that dock won't be exposed except when they open the gates and move in. And the trucks will be able to be fully parked inside of those gates and closed if we choose to leave them there overnight. Uh, you'll see in the next part of this the, the south facade. And I think this is important uh, to note because we had uh, a meeting with the neighbors. I sent the neighbors an email this afternoon and told them that we'd have a link for them to go look at this. Uh, they were concerned about what that building was going to look like. And frankly, I think the front of this looks not as nice as the front, but darn close. You know, it's not the, the site of an old gym that they were worried about, so it's pretty nice. Uh, this black gate is to the loading dock where the dumpsters will be. So these gates would open up to the garbage trucks will be back up there. This door right here is the entrance to the lower level uh, of the gymnasium and foyer area, which is ADA accessible. And then inside there's an elevator, not too far, so we'll be able to transverse up to the second floor. But the south facade, this is a precast concrete panels, limestone blasted, look pretty nice. Windows into the upper level of the gym. Now you're moving around to the, uh, what I would call the east side of the gym, and there's going to be a new parking lot there between the gym and the existing softball field. Softball, softball field will, be, will stay as is. Uh, be, and this section right here is the back of the existing uh, locker rooms. So you're gonna, this next part of the video takes you inside, so we'll go up the steps onto the, uh, I, would, I would call the commons patio area. Uh, it will look very nice. You might notice this wrought iron fence and parapet wall to keep people from looking down into that loading dock area. So this takes you in through the front doors. The graphics have been improved from the last time you saw the, the plans. Uh, you know, there's too much emphasis on sports. I think they've gone away from that and put it on academics where it needs to be with a little sports. This is the lower level uh, dining area. You can see they're going to put some nice booths in there. This will be uh, similar to the booths that are at West High. There will be some raised patio tables over here, similar to what we did at Liberty High. Uh, and actually, we're on the upper level. Are we not? Yes, yeah, we are. And there's the elevator. So you can see out into that commons area, that patio area. There'll be a set of steps also going down to the lower area, which is this right here. So that's the lower level cafeteria area. <coughs> These doors right here are uh, basically glass overhead doors that open into the servery for the kitchen. There's other mechanical uh, equipment behind these doors. Now you can take a look back and see the upper level balcony and eating area. Now you're moving into the new wrestling room, which is adjacent to that lunch room. I don't know if we have those fancy ceilings. We'll have to talk about that. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, <laughs> if, is, is this real? No, I, it's, yeah, I think it's hyped a little bit. Okay. So now you're going into the gym, uh, all the state championships, of course. This is the lower level of the gym. And you see up to the right, that walkway that goes around, there's an eighth, eighth of a mile walkway around the gym on that upper level where the upper balconies are. The first addition to this video, this scores table was on the floor. I had them put it back off the floor. I thought it might be a problem. These windows right here are the windows that you see from the south side that the neighbors will see in that, in that wall. Pretty sharp. So here you're on that lower level again, looking back out through the front door, uh, that upper level commons. And it's a, it'll be a good student gathering area. That's one of the things they really like at City High. I think it'll improve it a lot. And that was it.
If that had answered any questions, you might have. Um, the length, uh, the ramps that you show there, mm -hmm. that is, do you have any, any idea on uh, the length from the ground floor to get to the top to get up there? How, many, how far do you have to go to raise that? Well, level? it's based on the height, and it's a foot per inch. So I'm guessing there's probably, without looking, close to 100 feet or more. 100, 100, 120. Going, going up, mm -hmm. zigzagging before, but someone on a wheelchair can go around to the side and get an elevator? Yes. Okay. And, and it looks like a lot of ramp, but it's an inch per foot, which no, is... No, it, it, it has to be. Yeah. If you're gaining, if you're going that high, it has to be that long. That's that's the, you know, it, it, and it, it had better be so we don't have to rip it out and do yeah. it again, because over at City High, we have a bad history of putting in ramps that aren't, aren't the right... Uh, Hopefully Great. not on my watch. Well, whatever. They, they'll, it, it, they'll, is, it has happened. This will help. That ramp will also be very convenient if you're going to the front office or to the front, the old gym. We'll get you up into that area as well. So if you want to get to the front office uh, for... Uh, so some a parent comes that wants to go to the office. Could use this ramp as well. Could unless, use that ramp. Unless you want to come in off the south door. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but I mean, with that elevator there without having to do any ramps, I'm assuming that on that backside area, you're gonna have a, a huge amount of handicap parking for, for people there. Actually, it'll probably be on the south side of the school. There'll be a little parking there, some. By the ramp area itself? Yes. Okay. Um, the, can you go back to those sure. uh, gates for your dumpsters? And it seems like it gets darker when you put the cursor up by it, which makes it even more shadowed. That's all right. You just want to look at the doors. Well, um, here. So essentially, here, it's, here's what I was talking about, Phil. This ramp comes up right into this area. You no, know, I, I could. I when, when it went, it, it's it's self-explanatory. It's just that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tremendous amount of distance to to get up there because we. Well, the challenge is at least that. 120. Okay, so there's there's a you're gated there for mechanical. The first set. The first set is for mechanical required for the kitchen. Okay. The second set is for loading dock for the kitchen for vehicles for a semi truck and or straight truck. Okay, going in going in that way. Yes, they back in. Okay, and but we're going to take our twin screw garbage truck through the side one. No, it won't go. It'll just back up to it. These, these, uh, the docks raised from the level of the, of the, where the trucks are at, this dock is at a higher level, and the truck, the garbage truck will open the gates, can back up and attach to the dumpsters. It will not drive into there. So there's, so behind the gate, there's a loading dock. There's a loading dock and the dumpster on the loading dock. Okay, so what's the height of the, so it's a higher elevation, so when you're removing snow, you've got to back drag that out that way. You can't come out that side. You have to drag it out probably through the big gates. Through the big gates going forward. Okay. Um, in the gym, what's the, uh, the seating capacity? We were told that earlier. It's. I want to say it's between two and 3,000. Right. I can get an accurate number for right. you. And we don't have any figures on what our average attendance is. Or when we, when we, when we asked, they said they didn't, they didn't have a number. We should be able to. We well, I, I can ask again, but I suspect during tournaments is when you'll fill the place. Well. And school assemblies. All school assemblies that will be able to fit all the all students there. Sure. But uh, when you have a, if you have a 3,000 seat gymnasium and you have 200 people show up and when the custodians have to clean it at the end of the game, they have to go through every single row of seats, uh, whether someone's sitting in it or not. You wouldn't have to pull them all out, but that's the site management issue. Oh, okay. right, right. And uh, um, and I, I'm glad you brought up before anyone else did the extravagance of the ceilings in there. Um, well, that ceiling right, that right ceiling right there is probably pretty accurate. It's an exposed metal joist, you know, with some. Sure. But the, but the ceiling in the restroom, room, I think, is a little. In the wrestling room, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I agree, and I think that's 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 going a little bit over the top. 
Now, uh, I'll sound like a broken record. Uh, is there any has has is there been any consideration given to career in tech or where our uh, ag classes are going to be in this facility, in this building? Well, certainly with the, moving the cafeteria and the lunchroom and the kitchen, we'll create an open space that has no designation at this point. But we've talked many times about that being a future career tech center. Uh, and frankly, we're going to do the same thing with City High that we're doing with West High right now is trying to figure out how much of the scope is really doable and is important to the students. I realize career tech's important, but there are parts of this building that were renovated in 2005. And we did part of it since I've been here, 13 or 14. We did the fine arts back in 2012. So there are parts of the building that don't need to be done. There, there's some upgrades to lighting, but we may take those and set them aside for a future sales tax project. We're gonna do the same thing at West. So there's an opportunity, assuming the sales tax pass, that there'll be some funds there to do a career tech center, I hope so. So you're putting career and tech contingent on sales tax passing? There's no plans in the current scope to do any improvements for career tech in that part of the building. But there is space available should we choose to do it. Not the answer you wanted, but that's the way we're working. Will the kitchen be a culinary kitchen like at West? Could be. It'd be a good place for one. You, you might want to modernize the equipment. I don't know how much of that equipment will get moved to the new kitchen. We haven't had that discussion yet. I assume some, a lot of it will stay, but whether or not it's appropriate, I'm not the one to tell you. And uh, that, excuse me for interrupting. Yeah. Okay, but but the one, so is, is that a seating area on the other side of the steps? Uh, the steps come down and then uh, if, yeah. yeah, go a little Back bit further. further. No, you get, let it go forward, and it comes back around and looks back at the steps. Off to the side, is that seating there? Looks yeah. like it. Back here? Yes. Oh, oh no, over here. Right. Next to the steps. Are, oh, I assume it's a seating area, yes. Okay. Yeah. Students can sit there and, you know, hang out. Any further questions? Dwayne, is this a shareable video? Is this something that can be shared? Or? Well, yeah, I asked Kristen today to put it on the website so there'd be a link. It's a large file. It is in your admin content okay. folder. You do have possession of it, but it's a, it's a very tough file to email. Uh, so we thought we'd provide a link to it. Right. I was just thinking of our board communication piece yeah. that goes out. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Kristen uh, was going to release it in the morning to the press and put it on the website, and I know that uh, Principal Bacon already has it. And then with, uh, so we're going to single entry in, the, in all our schools. So City High single entry will still be the office, the main, the main office entry, or what, what's going to be the one entrance getting into that building? Well, uh, I think there could be, there'll be multiple entrances that you'd have to have a video phone possibly to the front office, but any, any access point would have to be via a camera. So. There's, there's now one at the entrance between the main building and the old gym that the students use. Uh, but I think if we finish the project, we can certainly add one on the, on the new wing. But there'd be a video camera there so that you'd have to be recognized by somebody in the offense, but definitely have electronic controls. And the plaza outside that, you know, the outside gathering area um, that's going to be open for students to come in and out of throughout the day or is that just a lunchtime gathering well, place or after I, school you know, all, all of our schools at the secondary level have multiple entry points before and after school and then during school the goal is to have a single entry point okay so during the day that that's correct. They, right. They, so right now you can only get in and out of one door at each of the three high schools. Any other questions? Is there a motion to approve Appendix 9? So moved. Second. Kim, ready to vote? 
online voting is open. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with directors Rotlin, Ressler, Godwin, Clausen, and Eyestone voting yay and director Hemingway voting nay. Thank you. So next up is discussion item on attendance area building blocks. And um, I'll just note before maybe Steve, you can like highlight some of the last changes that have come on, but uh, the board has had a lot of discussion on the original proposal. We had a community listening post on October 30th. We had a work session November 6th. We also, uh, took that feedback from people who came to that listening post and also the inputs that we've gotten from email and phone. Um, had a discussion as a, at a work session on 11-6, and then we had a follow-up uh, community listening post just last Thursday. Um, and I uh, had, a, I think, a pretty good turnout to that uh, and, and took a lot of good questions and, and, and um, feedback from the community on making some additional changes, whether it be to the building block, attendance area work, or the voluntary transfer policy. So um, our goal tonight is to review uh, where we are with the proposed attendance area changes um, and then have discussion at the board table on how it's looking and questions and comments that we have. Uh, so I'd certainly like to express my appreciation of the board for your willingness to attend multiple community listening posts. Uh, that has been very beneficial for us as we've heard from uh, many members of the community in specific neighborhoods, um, often in large groups uh, at the listening posts or in between via email uh, and phone. And that has certainly, um, from my perspective from the outside looking in, helped uh, the board as they've uh, made decisions about uh, 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 as we get closer to the final version of the attendance areas. So some of the things that you see tonight uh, are reflections of movement between the 6th and the 8th and then back uh, because we uh, put together some uh, various changes uh, that we took out to the community on the 8th as part of that process. Quite a bit of dialogue at that meeting um, resulted us in, in us moving some of those changes back to what we were on the 6th. Um, and some back before that. So again, as an iterative process, there have been um, some movement forward and backward as those attendance areas have flexed. So what I'll do is uh, give you just a real quick overview. I'll go through the maps. Um, I would welcome you, uh, as we did with the community on the 8th, please stop as we're going through it. If there's things that uh, we want to make sure that we emphasize to the general public or if there's questions that you have. Oops, if I can make this work here, there we go. Uh, there are three sets of uh, charts here from a color standpoint. Uh, reading left to right, uh, the numbers in green uh, reflect uh, students who qualify uh, for low socioeconomic status. Uh, the numbers in blue are percentages of students who qualify for English language learner. The numbers in orange uh, are the numbers of students who qualify for special education. Uh, and then the numbers in red are the capacity numbers for the building. Uh, we're looking at uh, three different sets of data represented differentially here. Uh, in the first two slides, the data on the left is where we are today. Um, and that includes voluntary transfers. Again, remember that we have almost 800 students that are voluntarily transferred out of their home attendance area. Uh, so those are the numbers that are in the left-hand columns on the slides two and three. Um, on this, uh, oops, on slide one here, uh, these are the numbers that are represented, whoops, in the um, static standpoint if the board takes no additional action based on the board's approval of new attendance areas for 2019-20. So uh, barring any action from the board, these are the attendance areas that would be in place for next fall. Um, please keep in mind that that rec uh, recognizes no voluntary transfers, so these are live-in numbers in each one of those attendance areas. Um, and you can see the change there from today uh, to tomorrow, again, if the board takes no action. Steve, just to point out, those yes. boundaries for 2019 were decided in 2016. Yes, yeah, so that so was part well. of the attendance area process that occurred during the 2015-16 school year, voted on by the board in the spring of 2016 to go into effect when uh, New Hoover uh, on uh, American Legion uh, and uh, Christine Grant Elementary School open. Uh, the next slide, which is on page three, uh, shows uh, again the current uh, with voluntary transfers included attendance areas and then the revisions uh, that the board has been going through. Uh, and so there's some differential between this and the board approved attendance areas. Um, one of the questions that was asked a couple of meetings ago now was can we see those side by side? So on slide four, uh, again, this is the uh, static take no action uh, attendance areas for next year uh, based on that 15-16 decision. And then over here on the right side are the proposed changes that the board has been considering uh, over the past few months. 
um, of uh, note uh, as you go through this. Um, you'll recognize that uh, one of the things that um, we see uh, on the numbers on the right, uh, the scales are uh, conditionally formatted, uh, so it helps uh, see the high to low. Uh, and you know, one of the things that you can note as you look through here is um, there's a little less pronouncement in the really dark and the really light. Um, ELL might be a good uh, example of that where they're almost all the same color and that's because um, we're getting a more even distribution of students, uh, or I'm sorry, in special ed, there are more even distribution of students uh, that qualify. So uh, that's how to look at those. Um, one of the questions that was asked was, uh, what does this look like uh, in terms of last year to this year so I can see the uh, change graphically represented? Uh, the uh, bar in blue, uh, again, is today with voluntary transfers included. The bar in orange is with the proposed changes that the board uh, has considered. I think one of the things that's important to note here, uh, the goal of the board has always been to try to equalize to the greatest extent possible distribution of students across the district. Um, if you look at the middle of the chart uh, and you start over here at Lucas uh, and run uh, to your right uh, and come over here to Van Allen, um, in between 24 and 47 percent, uh, we have a larger clustering of buildings now than we've uh, had in the past. Uh, we now only have two schools that are over 70% in free and reduced lunch eligibility. Remind you that this year for the first time, Kirkwood Elementary School is over 80%. Um, you can see that they dropped to uh, just under 71% here. Um, so there are some pretty significant gains uh, to be had for the students. Uh, and the other thing to note is that um, that's occurring as the buildings are being right-sized. So. Uh, there'll be less crowding in those high needs buildings uh, and also some reduction uh, in uh, the students who are low socioeconomic status. There are some uh, changes that take place building to building. Uh, many are very small. We do have several, if you look at either end of this uh, chart, that are a little bit bigger. Um, Lincoln and Longfellow uh, have a significant increase in the number of low socioeconomic students attending. Um, over here on the right side, you see that Twain, Lucas, Mann, and Penn have a reduction in students. Um, who are low socioeconomic status. Uh, one reminder uh, that was brought forward to us by the Lincoln staff, which I would just share with you because they reiterated it to me again uh, this past week, is that um, they're very excited about uh, the change in their school. Um, they've been working very hard for the last couple of years to prepare for it, um, and they wanted me to let you know that they are not only excited about it, but feel well prepared um, for the change in their student demographics. Uh, now to look at the maps. Uh, and again, uh, just a reminder on formatting, uh, the red line uh, shows us uh, the board approved 2019-20 attendance area. The yellow line shows the proposed changes. Uh, when you look at any one of these maps, the predominant color is the current attendance area. So here we're looking at Alexander, and this dark pink uh, area is the current uh, Alexander attendance area. Uh, and in red would be uh, the proposed area for uh, 2019-20 barring board action. You can't quite see it here, but this area, which is um, the Lake Ridge community, uh, is actually part of the Alexander attendance area in that approved uh, zone. And then the proposal uh, is the yellow zone, so you can see that that area is no longer attached uh, to Alexander Elementary School. In each of the charts on the next pages, you'll see the data is the same here. We've got the 18-19 numbers, that's today, uh, with our uh, voluntary transfers. Uh, and then the next set of numbers are the proposed changes that the board is uh, making uh, for next year. Uh, again, Alexander is a good example. Uh, we know with the weighted resource allocation model, we've struggled in some of our high needs buildings to find enough uh, seats uh, for students because we have fewer kids per classroom. Uh, so we were very deliberate uh, in our dialogue over the past couple months about right sizing the building for use. Um, I know Lori brought it up, there's definitely a difference between what we would call fire code capacity, how many kids can you fit in the building, and use capacity, and that is how many kids um, we would prefer to have in the building given the class sizes that we're using under the weighted resource allocation model. So in a building like Alexander, um, you see we're down to 321 students, so it's a reduction uh, of approximately 100 students. Um, you see that we get some slight gains uh, in each of those three demographic areas. Uh, probably most important to Alexander uh, is we find ourselves from a capacity standpoint uh, in a position where we can eliminate the modular units outside, um, reclaim some of the space inside the school that's currently being used for classrooms. I won't spend as much time on each of the next maps, but that's the framework that we'll look at as we go through each of those. Steve, just before you move yes. on, um, for public knowledge, we've talked about this at the work session a few times, but 
that Alexander demographic, the SES number goes down to 68.2, but from what we've been told, you're seeing that younger grades, that number is a lot lower. So as they age through the system, we expect that number to drop Yes, somewhat. thank you for bringing that up. So when we look at the uh, grade level profile, uh, we are seeing uh, a lower number of students uh, in the low SES categories as you go down grade by grade. Um, and again, if you think about that and you think about the growth uh, of the uh, uh, Alexander attendance area, we've got a road over here that the city's in the process of putting through uh, shortly. We've got uh, several subdivisions that are plotted uh, out here, and so we anticipate that uh, as we move forward, we can continue to see uh, progress with those demographic statistics. Um, at Borlaug, uh, the major change here is moving the Boston Way neighborhood, which is currently part of the Kirkwood Elementary School, uh, and move that into Borlaug. Um, as you can see uh, right now, one of the challenges that we had was trying to make sure that um, uh, the current status of Borlaug is overpopulated. Uh, we know what the capacity is. Um, and uh, given the, uh, the students there and uh, the size of the building, uh, in the neighborhoods that we have. Uh, we knew we had to move some students out, so you're going to see as we move into um, some of our other maps uh, further down, you're going to see that this area of uh, Borlaug up here and this area down in the southeast corner have been moved uh, to new attendance areas to make way for the students uh, from Boston Way. At Coralville Central, uh, again, you can see their overcapacity today. Um, so our goal was to bring them inside that capacity number uh, in order to do that and uh, to prepare well for the future. Um, the, and I keep doing this now, all I can think of is the 100 acre wood, Lori. Bridgewater. Bridgewater. Uh, Lori told me it was the 100 acre wood and I can't get that out of my head anymore. But uh, this development that's going in up here, uh, that's off of Oakdale, uh, we know it's platted. We know that it'll have, uh, it'll produce students uh, when it goes up. Uh, significant concern raised in earlier conversations about an or already overpopulated Coralville Central um, really struggling to accommodate those students. Uh, so you'll see as we get to Lincoln uh, that we zone those students um, out of Coralville Central uh, and into Lincoln. And you can see now this brings us down to a more comfortable number uh, at Coralville Central, also seeing an improvement uh, in our demographics. Garner, uh, you remember we were just here last spring working on attendance areas, so I'm um, very comfortable with the Garner attendance area uh, as it was established as part of that uh, spring uh, uh, process. You can see substantially overpopulated right now if you're out there at Garner and you look to the left of the campus. Uh, we've got quite a few modular units parked out there. Looking forward to getting it back under 100% uh, capacity and, uh, and right-sizing it, in particular the lunch program out there is a real struggle running four different shifts of lunch right now so we're looking forward to getting back to a, a regular lunch program out there grant elementary school we had quite a bit of conversation about this um, this is the board approved attendance area uh, and uh, over the course of the last couple meetings we had conversations about uh, penn meadows over here and then this portion uh, south of penn street um, last uh, spring when we went through that process uh, we had uh, done maps under both uh, scenarios uh, and we had some conversation about that uh, at the meeting on the 6th. So the scenario you have in front of you here uh, maintains the board approved 2019-20 boundaries. On uh, Hills. Uh, by board approved, you mean the January approved? Yes, the yes. January approved. Or the whatever they were, February yes. approved. Yeah. spring approved. Uh, the uh, Hills attendance area loses a small number of students. Whoops. Um, loses a small number of students uh, up here on the north side of the district. That was part of our uh, rezoning process as we right-sized uh, Alexander Elementary School uh, and took advantage of the new capacity that we have at Longfellow. Uh, maybe one quick note on Hills. Uh, we had uh, actually originally looked, due to the uh, profile of students at Hills, about trying to take it down uh, to a lower capacity utilization. Uh, had some extensive dialogue with the staff at Hills. They expressed some real concerns about uh, economies of scale. Uh, and by that they meant if we went too small, um, if we took this down to 140 or 150 kids, they really experienced difficulties with scheduling their specials, art, music, and PE. Uh, so after a staff listening post down there, quite a bit of really good dialogue with their team. Uh, when we came back, the feedback to you as a board was um, we really need to keep approximately 175 to 200 students there um, so we get that uh, efficiency in terms of class sizes and staffing for specials.
Phil? And, and, uh, who initiated that conversation on bringing it? What, what was the rationale, I should say, what was the rationale in bringing it smaller? So one of the things, again, when you look at hills uh, and you consider the RAM utilization down there, we struggle to have enough classrooms to fit the students. So we've got some modular units down there right now. Um, in the long run, we'd like to see an expansion of that campus right, uh, yeah. so that we can put those uh, uh, classrooms on there without having to have the students and outside. Hills was, and Hills was left off the, the, the plan. So. so we're hoping to meet with their uh, city council here after the turn of the new year and, and have some dialogue about next steps with Hills. Um, Hoover out on the American Legion. Uh, we had a couple of changes from the, uh, the board approved attendance area. One is this uh, eastern uh, portion of the Lemmy attendance area. This portion of Lemmy is uh, slated to go to the new Hoover. Uh, and so uh, we expanded that slightly going uh, to the west. Um, so now we have this entire brown uh, shaded area up here are all Lemmy students that will transfer uh, to New Hoover. Um, we already had this section of Lucas students that are moving to New Hoover. And we're now looking at this section of students down here or Alexander students. Um, and they will also be transitioning to the New Hoover. Um, you can see that there's still uh, adequate capacity. We're about 73%. We anticipate, as with other new schools, we're going to see some housing developments out there. Um, we're pretty comfortable that there's space for students at this time. Uh, gives us a good demographic mix out there. Um, nice population of students, so no one group of students from any neighborhood is moving in a small number. They'll have a lot of classmates uh, and colleagues uh, from their current home school moving into the new school. Uh, Horn, uh, we had a lot of conversation about this over the past couple of weeks. Uh, I know you've heard from many, many parents. We had quite a few of them present uh, last Thursday uh, at uh, our uh, community meeting. Uh, and this section of Horn down here uh, was part of, or this section of Weber, the brown shaded area, was part of Horn. Uh, back in 1718, was moved to Weber to try to relieve some overcrowding at Horn. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, community members on both sides of this issue. Uh, they would either like to stay at Weber in some cases or like to be returned to Horn. Uh, and so we had uh, quite a few impassioned pleas at our uh, meeting last Thursday about uh, either moving them or retaining them. Uh, but uh, I think the one thing that we had in consensus um, from folks that were there was whichever direction you go, can you please provide some grandfathering? So one of the requests that the board made was to better understand who are the students that live uh, in this particular neighborhood. Um, this chart to the left shows us uh, the 78 kids that live in that neighborhood, grades K to 6, um, and where they currently attend school. Um, obviously, you can see the largest number of students attend both Horn and Weber. Uh, of that 78, 11 of them are currently sixth graders and will be matriculating uh, on to junior high. Uh, so that leaves us 67 kids currently enrolled. Um, and you can see the distribution by grade level and by school for those students. Kirkwood, uh, we got two changes to the Kirkwood attendance area. As I said, the Boston Way neighborhood, which is out here to the left. Um, and then, I don't know if there's a name for this neighborhood here, but um, this section of the Kirkwood attendance area here, you'll see as we get to Wickham, transition out. Again, this gives us a nice number of students in the building, given the weighted resource allocation model and the needs. One side effect that's a real plus for us as we look at uh, remodeling coming up in the facilities master plan. Uh, this gives us a little bit of flexibility um, as we phase through the school and do the remodeling there. So we're excited about that. Less displacement of students um, as we walk through the school. Lemmy Elementary School, um, a little bit harder to see. I should have blown this one up too um, because the Breckenridge neighborhood, um, which is down here, which was assigned to Longfellow, uh, in the original decision back in the fall of 16 has now been returned uh, to Lemmy. That's one of the reasons that this area here was displaced and moved to Hoover um, so that we could make sure to keep the building uh, from a capacity standpoint uh, uh, with uh, not only room to grow because of some of the developments that are going out there but also uh, gives us the ability to ensure that we've got the right size classrooms there. And maybe make a note, the Breckenridge community and the Lemmy community um, were instrumental in that retention. Not unlike the folks that we heard from Mann who came here today, um, they've been active in asking uh, to stay at Lemmy. Lincoln Elementary School, uh, this looks a little bit like a quilt. Uh, and again, this was a domino effect. As we looked at moving the Forest View students back to Mann, remember Forest View was part of that uh, original rezoning and they were supposed to go to Lincoln when we moved them out. If you remember about four meetings ago, um, there was a little bit of shock when we came in and saw that that took Lincoln down under 150 students. Uh, and so we had a really good dialogue uh, at the board table at that time about um, both uh, looking for current and future students to populate uh, Lincoln following the remodeling. 
And um, we've included uh, the neighborhood up here uh, that we're looking at uh, potential expansion. We've included the Iowa River Landing. Uh, if you're up and down First Avenue right now in Coralville, you know there's quite a bit of building going on up there. Uh, and so these are future students uh, that would uh, attend Lincoln. Um, we also looked at, uh, again, uh, freeing up some space at Borlaug. Uh, with some uh, students on the east side of their attendance area. And then uh, down here on the uh, uh, south part of the, uh, this proposed Lincoln attendance area are students in the Miller Orchard neighborhood. Um, a reminder that they receive attendance support busing at this time. Uh, and so we would reposition uh, that attendance support busing from uh, Horn up to Lincoln so those students would still have that uh, opportunity for transportation. Again, uh, Lincoln was excited about this because it takes them north of 200. Uh, just like Hills, they're looking for that operational sweet spot and recognize from an economy of scale that they need to be in that neighborhood to make sure, especially with their uh, grade level cohorts and their uh, specials, that they can operate efficiently. Longfellow Elementary School. Uh, again, uh, uh, the renovation that uh, is taking place there right now is going to give us a few extra classrooms because of uh, the way that we were able to reclaim some space upstairs there. Um, and in order to uh, populate that appropriately, uh, also look for a, a good distribution of students uh, on, uh, on that east side of the district there. Um, we're looking at moving uh, the Lake Ridge neighborhood uh, up to Longfellow. Um, you can see that uh, it changes our demographics. Um, gives us uh, a few more students uh, next year than we have this year, uh, but it as a building will have um, the largest change in population um, simply because they have so many students that will be going to the new Hoover out on American Legion Road. Uh, Lucas Elementary School looks very similar to the attendance area that was approved back in 1516, uh, and again, uh, one of the best uh, outcomes of this is um, we'll take a school that's overpopulated right now, uh, with the opening of New Hoover, we'll be able to take it back down um, to a comfortable capacity uh, number for use of classroom space. Uh, and here we have Man, uh, and the big change to Man was the addition of uh, that uh, Forest View neighborhood. Um, you heard from some of the parents tonight, they were present with us on uh, Thursday night uh, at our last uh, uh, community meeting. Um, I've had some feedback from them uh, in between the meeting. Um, they're very pleased with uh, the discussion that took place on Thursday night, um, are excited about that opportunity to stay at, uh, at Mann. Penn Elementary School, uh, again, this is the same attendance area that was approved by the board last spring after we went through that process. Um, and again, a reminder from that conversation with Garner, here's your Penn Meadows neighborhood and your south of Penn neighborhood over here, um, which was a big part of that discussion last spring about um, how best to divide the, uh, the population of students in that area. Shimmick, uh, untouched uh, from the, uh, the last round, uh, and uh, we maintain close to that 200 number there, so um, they're very, uh, very comfortable with that from a capacity standpoint. Twain, uh, again, uh, we go from a building that is, uh, although it says 94% capacity here, that would be based on that fire code capacity. Right now, currently, uh, from a use capacity, really struggling there. If you've been in the Twain Library, um, you know that uh, we built an ELL classroom in there. Right now, we've got some temporary dividers in there. We're able to do um, Title I and reading recovery work. Um, the library itself uh, has shrunk to about 25% of its original size. Uh, by right-sizing the building for the utilization of RAM, we're excited to get that instructional space back for them. We also have art on a cart there right now, and we're looking to get that, that back into a regular classroom. Just one, again, clarification for public there, that this was the boundary that was approved in 2016, and that northernmost line um, pretty much goes along the railroad track? Yes, this follows the railroad track. If you look at this blue line here and the red line here, that's actually uh, the, uh, the railroad line. Van Allen Elementary School, you got a change here. Uh, and again, uh, we had parents present at our uh, work session on Thursday. The Stables neighborhood, which is down here in the corner, uh, has been pretty active in terms of their lobbying for you. Uh, it's a very small number of kids. They were really concerned about that small number of students um, being moved to Wickham. Um, if you look at most of the other changes that we're making, there's a sizable number of kids going from one building to another, so a much higher likelihood that they're traveling with a grade level cohort and friends when they're making that transition. Um, we had some parents that were pretty impassioned about their concern about kids being individual grade level moves um, and traveling with no grade level friends. And so um, that was one of those changes that we made between uh, last week and this week. Um, I, I vaguely remember in some of the emails from the Steelers, somebody saying something like, uh, 
Their house was like 1.9 miles away from Van Allen, but they were fine with it. I'm wondering the two little dots that are farther south from that that are, aren't in the stables, are they, would they be requiring a bus? That is a good question. I do not know the answer to that. We can certainly get a measure on that from Durham. That would, that would be a concern. I know we talked about whether there'd be increased busing or, or not, and a bus for two kids might be asking a lot. My understanding is that's the bus that's families. filled with pay -to ride students right I was, now. That's what I was going to guess. Is okay. So we probably have a lot of pay -to ride kids coming out of this neighborhood here. Mm -hmm. That'd be my guess. So I think there's only a couple kids that are required, but it's filled up with a waiting list. Okay. Um, yeah. With other kids. We can We're not adding another that. one. I, I, they'd no. be okay. If, if it looks like it's an ad bus, we'll definitely let you know. If it turns out that it is indeed that pay -to ride bus, oh, um, yeah. then I, they, right. that won't add a bus for us. And Paul just remember they're already there, so that yep. that bus is already yeah, you're right. Yeah. Weber Elementary School, it's a very large geographic attendance area, so I blew up the corner of it so you can see this. Um, this is Pheasant Ridge, um, currently zoned to Weber. Uh, and then uh, this neighborhood here, this follows the creek uh, as you come down there. Um, so think behind West High School and going across uh, uh, where Shannon Drive is down here. Um, moving these students out to Weber. Oops, i move this back up a little bit so you can see that. Um, and again, that's to help us at uh, Borlaug make way for the, um, uh, the uh, students that are coming down from Boston Way. One of the things that we heard a lot from, I know a couple of you forwarded emails from parents, they were really concerned that as we looked at the three schools, Borlaug, Weber, and Horn, um, that we go back and sharpen our pencils a little bit um, and really look at uh, the population balance, the demographic balance, and see what we could do to get them a little bit closer to each other. Um, we think this does that. Um, it, uh, it's probably a little more full than we would like to see at Weber, but certainly not uh, out of the realm of, of uh, uh, operational uh, efficiency there. So um, comfortable with this as a, as a change to the attendance area. Um, from a historical standpoint, I was reminded by a couple of parents that this is all former Weber attendance area, that prior to Borlaug opening up, um, this was part of Weber. Um, the one parent reminded me that much of what you as a board are experiencing right now with parents who don't want to move um, for one reason or another uh, is the same thing that we went through when Borlaug opened and uh, the parent uh, with a good sense of humor reminded me that they were one of the people that lived in this neighborhood that came and vocally complained about being sent to Borlaug um, at that point in time. Uh, so uh, they, they were very comfortable with the move, uh, understood why it was proposed, but uh, had just contacted me um, to make sure that we didn't forget that historical lesson. Um, Wickham, uh, the big change for Wickham uh, is this area down here, uh, part of the Kirkwood attendance area uh, that we would zone up to Wickham. Um, given the uh, current enrollment at Wickham of 483, moving down to 409, one of the things I'd point out with Wickham is we've got several, several of our low incidence special ed programs there. Um, so if you're out at Wickham, you'd find that we've got several classrooms that are being used for special education, but have a very small number of students in there. So that makes this capacity number just a bit deceiving uh, because uh, from a utilization uh, standpoint, um, that capa or the, the use, uh, use capacity at Wickham is much higher than what it shows uh, for the capacity here uh, because of the presence of those programs. And those are long-standing programs that have been at Wickham Elementary School for quite some time. Um, Grant Wood Elementary School, again, a uh, great opportunity for us here uh, as we look at uh, making sure that the school stays right-sized. Um, uh, for those of you who have any connection with Wood, um, they would tell you that uh, there's been an amazing difference in the school uh, since Alexander opened up. Um, they were uh, uh, very uh, direct with me about, uh, when I talked to the staff out there, about making sure that they stayed um, at or about the capacity that they're at right now because they fit uh, in their building. So. Um, we're pleased that these numbers uh, put us in, in that same range uh, that we looked at uh, last time. So you have all been through the journey with me as we've been at board meetings and work sessions. Hopefully I captured uh, much of the feedback that we got from the community and the dialogue that you had, but if there's anything else to add, uh, certainly happy to do that or answer any questions you might have. Um, on the Wickham change with the, those Kirkwood kids, is that likely going to be some attendance area busing down there? They do not have attendance area busing right now. That was one of the right. things we checked. But we also know, having talked to the uh, uh, staff at uh, Kirkwood, it's a, an attendance problem area. Right. Uh, so it didn't qualify in that last round for attendance support busing. Um, we uh, had a conversation about uh, uh, 
how that busing would work and uh, where pay to ride uh, might be able to uh, not only pick up those students but transport additional Wickham students as they move up there. The only thing I would ask is that, and I know this is not my, it's not for me to say, but, but please don't have those students be like, you know, going to the north side of Wickham attendance zone to pick up students oh. and then back down to Wickham. No, what um, uh, the conversation you know, if you're talking was, as it passes, ride. yeah, on its way up there. Yeah, just hopefully they, are, they can go straight there so they don't end up having to be on the bus for an hour. Right. And I just say that because I know that's been an issue with the North Central bus mm -hmm. and Kirkwood kids. Other comments or questions? I, th I think I looked it up right on the homeschool lookup, but if you go back up to your um, Hoover map. The very top uh, line right there uh, the, the actual red and yellow line that you have up there. If you slide that all the way up to Herbert Hoover Highway, that will grab those kids because if you look them up now, they're scheduled in the homeschool lookup to go to Hoover, but just. Our homeschool lookup, our homeschool lookup is supposed to be geocoded to our attendance area, so I, uh, there have been a couple of those areas that we've discovered. Adam's usually really good about getting those connected. So is your question, does the map change or does the homeschool lookup change? Well, I'm, if you keep the line where it's at, you're, there's a development up there right now mm -hmm. that goes all the way up to Herbert Hoover Highway. So you need to, you're either gonna have some houses that fall in Lemmy or Hoover. So it'll divide the, the subdivision. Yeah, so just yep. move that line all the way up to the... We can definitely do that. We actually, from that standpoint, uh, our preference is to use those geographic lines, whether it's a river, the railroad, a major road, um, as, as that division point. Um, and I would presume, but I could be wrong, you know, when we went through that process of uh, neighborhood identification and voting uh, back in 1516, my guess is that the neighborhood up here um, talked about being moved into New Hoover, and so we probably drew the line just north of that neighborhood without thinking about where the development was going. Yeah, I would assume that no houses were there yeah. then as I live over in that area. So that's a change we'd be asking to see mm -hmm. on we the 27th. Yep. We can have that ready. I think you have all the kids in there. I think they fall on that line. It's just to make sure that the map line goes all the way up to that. Um, on the the horn map, and it looks like did we add on the the Melrose Circle little area oh. there to kind of yes. react to some of that feedback? It looks like it is, and I'm just yes. trying to make sure I got my Thank bearings. That that's that sort of top right triangle part was added on. Four kids that are up here, and I think all the families were present on Thursday at our uh, listening post. Um, their concern was uh, essentially this is a very small cul-de-sac. It's not an area that's going to be developed um, and uh, again a very small number of kids um, and their request was uh, retention I can tell you that when the line was originally drawn you could see the railroad tracks coming through here so when we were looking to populate uh, Lincoln Elementary School we came right down the railroad tracks um, and so there wasn't an intentionality of uh, removing them from horn it was really a geographic function so um, we were able to square that off of the road here thank you the other question I have, it's specifically on the your little chart there, which is very helpful. Um, uh, the, the question I have, and I, I think we'll probably discuss it more potentially at, at work session or, or, or not, but uh, we discussed, you know, leaving, I think, if I remember right, from last Thursday, leaving the boundary the way it is, but then allowing the folks that are in there that wanted to stay at Weber to stay at Weber, right, right, um, as as a possibility. Now, uh, looking at the numbers, that's a much bigger number than if you went the other direction, right, and put the boundary back to where the original line was, and then you have a much smaller number of folks that you'd have to worry about doing voluntary transfer, and they'd be people who are already voluntary transferring, if right, mm -hmm. um, so they understand the process. Mike. 
So that that would be my discussion on that part is whether or not we're making a, a bigger issue, particularly if you then start to look at future younger kids, yeah. how far down that yeah. route do you go, and that number is a, a more a bigger unknown number. Um, as a known number, if you do it now, I'm looking at the capacity now, and if you put them all in there, I think your number is going to be over the capacity. Yeah, if right? you remember, yeah, if you remember, uh, in one of the, uh, I want to say it was two, three, four board meetings ago, we had uh, we had moved some of the Borlaug neighborhood from the west side of Mormon Trek into Horn. Uh, and then in order to ensure that we could accommodate these students, we moved that neighborhood into Weber. So uh, if, if you wanted to leave this section, which is in Brown, which is the current Weber attendance area in Weber, and allow voluntary transfer into Horn, um, we would then go back, um, if you will, go back to one of those earlier versions of the map and pull some of the students from the west side over here uh, into Horn uh, as a replacement for the students that would be staying in Weber. I'm trying to go back and forth to my slides to look at the two different sets of numbers. So, I don't know. That's just something to think about as we as we look at that area specifically. I know that, you know, one of the biggest pushes to restrict voluntary transfer is to lessen the unknown as we're trying to figure out where kids go. And if one way has, at current state, 54 kids and one has 16, and you don't know how many of them are going to voluntary transfer, I'd rather have 16 unknowns than 54. But um, that's part of it. The other point and it's not really a, a question necessarily because we don't have all the data here but I'm looking at uh, you know the first few slides that are just kind of looking at capacity numbers from one map to another map and we are looking at current capacity versus capacity at the end of the what, 20 at, at the end of the plan basically yes. and so I'm curious you know you have if the board does nothing this is what it looks like but that's not what it looks like next year that's what it looks like three years from now, and I'm curious, you know, Kirkwood, for instance, what would it look like next year if we did nothing, right? Because in my head, I think it'd be pretty full, right? And you look at the numbers on this chart, it doesn't look so bad, but next year it would look pretty bad, I think, if we didn't do anything. And so that'd be some numbers, I I, I don't know. I don't know if we need to we see that, but at least it's part we of the conversation. This, we, yeah, we, we were uh, fairly deliberate when we did this with the sense that we know how big the building is going to be and how many seats it will have when we fe complete the plan, especially on the accelerated plan. Uh, and our thought was if a building was higher in capacity next year because at Kirkwood the renovations aren't done yet, uh, we already have some modular units on campus at Kirkwood uh, and uh, we could accommodate students in our current modular uh, um, classrooms uh, until the time that this construction gets done because the, our other concern was if you set up the attendance zones for how big the schools are next year then in one or two years you might be looking at it and saying oh we have a building that's really drastically underutilized now we have to redraw the attendance areas so we thought about it from the standpoint of let's plan for 21-22 and if we've got a little growing pain between now and then we can accommodate that um, through our current uh, modular units um, rather than potentially having to come back and try to rezone again to try to populate classrooms that have been remodeled or added. Yeah, and I, I absolutely agree with that approach as we look at if we're going to change stuff, we should look to change for long term, not short term, and have to do this again to the same neighborhoods in a couple of years. But um, if our one of the choices that we have up here is do nothing oh, or do sure. something, right, the nothing has much bigger implications than these charts show so, what you're um, so i think it's important to at least have that out there that sure. that's some of the stuff we're reacting to because some of the boundary changes we're doing is because of capacity issues because of the restriction of voluntary transfer and that i think still has to happen mm -hmm. um but it, it i don't think that's as clear to to anyone who's kind of looking from the outside we can do that for you and, and about Kirkwood specifically, um, you had said that RAM schools ideally would be at 60% capacity yeah. and they would be considered full then at 60%. Yeah. And so if we did nothing, Kirk would be at 120%. So essentially there are twice as many kids as can fit in the entire building as a RAM 1 building. Yeah, that, and that's, that's a great point because um, 
when we were going through and looking at that, uh, we literally looked at it and said a, a RAM 1 school is between 60 and 80 percent would be full capacity there. That would be utilizing every available space with no room for growth. Um, and so that's why as you look through this map and you especially look at the new revised attendance areas, you can see there's a pretty deliberate plan to get the woods, uh, the Twains, uh, the Kirkwoods down to those numbers. The one that's really outside of that is Hills, which is north of 72 percent. But again, that was really a, a result of the conversation with the staff down there. We had it below 70 percent, and then they pushed back pretty hard on that because of that operational efficiency piece. Mm -hmm. So that's right, Lori. Thank you. It still would be helpful if we could yep. have a usage chart yep. versus fire code capacity. The the tough one for that uh, is. Um, we can do that from a this year standpoint because we know where they fall on RAM. We won't know that next year. I mean, we can project. It's just we tra we sat down and tried to do it. We were just struggling with it. And and frankly, we have plenty to do right now. This is not top of the list, okay? So I, I'm just speaking, If we can figure out a formula I, to make of, that work. I'm thinking of like when we look at our projections going forward, yep. those numbers would be helpful at that time. What, we don't uh, need it now. When we sat down and talked about it, what we thought might be easier than coming up with that was to go back to your earlier comment and say, in a RAM 1 school, this is full capacity. In a RAM 2 school, this is full capacity. So we might look at mm -hmm. it and say 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, what does that look like? So that gives us a better idea of where we want to hit this. So since we're kind of having a discussion here, because that's how it's listed, just to comment on something, maybe Sean with the Weber to Horn um, discussion. So one thing that I'm more likely to leave that section at Horn and let the Weber families decide to go to Weber um, would be distance. And some of those far, like West Side drives over two miles, 2.2 miles to get to Weber, plus you're crossing Mormon Trek Boulevard um, versus being able to walk, you know, through the park through Benton walkability uh, for future families as they turn over or, or uh, populate that area. So, I mean, that's one thing that's in my mind as far as looking at that as well. Any other comments or questions for this item? I know we've got a work session up next um, where we can maybe dig into that topic a little bit more as well as any changes that we would want to see proposed for voluntary transfer. Yeah, I mean, I just hopefully at this point we would be able, at least at the work session, maybe to move ahead with like saying a certain, this school looks good, this one looks good, yeah, you know, I to what to so vote too. on. Uh, otherwise, I just feel like we're kind of just playing ping pong. With I think so, actually, um, because uh, we're slated to vote on this on November 27th, and we don't have any additional work sessions scheduled given the Thanksgiving uh, uh, break next week. So this really is um, an important discussion here and at the work session to, like you said, just you know get as clear and concrete as we possibly can on, on what it is we're going to vote on on the 27th. Because we, we do recognize the need to vote on the 27th given the very long implementation plan, Amy, that you've been putting together. Anything else? I'm struggling with board docs, folks, and with a really, really slow connection. And so I think our next discussion item is um, policy, and a policy and governance up update. Is that, are you going to do that, Paul? Yeah. Um, at policy and governance, we uh, elected a new committee chair, and that's Ruthina. So she is not here today. Um, we only discussed one topic, correct? Sean, my memory serves, and that's the um, moving to, um, maybe Steve can display it a little bit better than I can, moving to you know, more of a consolidated um, policy uh, manual. Yep. Um, and before that, we uh, went through and just uh, validated the legislative uh, oh yeah. brochure, um, which I know feels like it's only November, but the legislative session's right around the corner, so um, we have that ready to go. Kristen's got the final version of it with the updated demographics on it, so um, she's got uh, copies of that going to printer, and we should have that for you at the next uh, meeting, so you'll have uh, hard copies of that with you to, to carry around. We'll get that posted um, with the six priorities on it. Uh, from the board policy structure, we had a conversation about uh, that movement away from the Carver governance policy to the um, regular policy governance process, um, and uh, 
talked about um, perhaps overly aggressive timeline according to some of the uh, committee members but uh, I've talked to the admin team and, and we're really going to try to push that and work as quickly as we can so we get some drafts um, uh, to you with that uh, just from a framework standpoint things we talked about um, that IASB policy governance process includes board policies um, they also have exhibits that are tied to those um, they have rules and regulations that are connected to that. Um, we recognize that uh, that's well and good for most districts in the state, but we also recognize the need to localize some of those. Uh, so we talked about putting guidelines um, that are Iowa City specific that are nested underneath those. Um, we also recognize that there are some policies that aren't included in their 100 and 900 versions, and so there'll be a need to have a 1,000 section that's specific to Iowa City. Uh, and so as we go through that conversion and try to take those um, 10 different links that we have on our board policy page and condense those down. Um, we'll find homes for those either in the existing policies, um, exhibits, um, rules and regulations, or we'll write using our materials, new policies, um, and guidelines to go along with that. Uh, one of the benefits that we talked about uh, regard to using that uh, ISB uh, policy primer service is that they keep us up to speed on changes at the federal and the state level um, with those departments of ed, keep us up to speed with Board of Educational Examiner changes, um, other statutory changes that take place through the legislature, and in particular the ones most difficult for us to keep up with um, are the court decisions both in the federal and the state level courts. And so uh, the benefit is whenever one of those changes, they immediately um, revise that policy and send that out to us. That allows us to push that through policy and governance, get that adopted, uh, make sure we're up to speed on that. Anything else? Thank you. Yeah, Phil. I've, I've got a question. Um, you know, years ago we put uh, a fraternization discussion on policy and governance and a conflict of interest. And I don't know that we, uh, that we formally put local preference, but we discussed about it, that it needed to go there. Um, with our changeover from one to the other, what, how, how are those discussions going to ha uh, hopefully happen? And how will, will they be guidelines? Will they be policies? Can you elaborate? Sure. On that? So twofold. One of them is that uh, we know looking through the ISB policy primer, some of those things are already covered in there. So we'll wind up with policy that comes from them on that conflict of interest and some of those other things that's internalized in their policies. So we'll already have a version of that that's going to show up in there. So that's going to be a plus for us. Then we'll have the opportunity to go through and review that. Um, and if we need to localize it, then we can write our own guidelines that sit underneath that. Um, if there's additional language we think we need to add to that. So we would have guidelines to a policy or we Yes. Would, okay. So if you think about it from a nested standpoint, um, IASB gives us guidelines, or I'm sorry, gives us policies. Um, then they also give us exhibits connected to those policies and sometimes some rules and regulations to uh, make those work. So that all comes as part of that IASB policy process. Uh, and then if there's something that we think that we need to add to localize that here in Iowa City, we'll write a guideline that sits underneath that that's nested right inside there. So as I was talking about it with the group today, it's kind of like coming down a funnel. So not every policy will have a guideline connected to it, but those that we think we need to localize here, we'll be able to do that with. And I know we've moved operations into a complete board discussion. Uh, I really think that with all that we're doing on this, that the entire board needs to be in those discussions as well. And that I know we've put a lot into our uh, Districting discussions and we've been devoting a lot of Tuesdays and things to this But I think this is important enough that all all if we're going to be discussing uh, facility discussions for uh, I think everyone needs to be involved in these discussions as well And I don't know if that's something that we need to make a, a motion to do or, or we use or work session time Absolutely where's board topics yeah. on policy and governance the, the committee can continue to function I think and bring topics for discussion here like we had tonight and then if we need to have work sessions where we uh, the full board can have that discussion I think we can I definitely that recommend way. that as the board gets as the policy and governance committee gets to the point where they're comfortable with the revisions that are in there then I would suggest that we probably need to yeah. have a, a work session devoted solely to the transition um, so that board members have a chance to go through it, see what's in there, familiarize themselves with it. I'll tell you, if you look at, for instance, our legally mandated policies, the new policy manual will have many more policies in there 
uh, than, than uh, what we currently have as our, our formal board policies. Plus the other thing, and, and I, I apologize because I know several of you have said this, but I can't remember what the origin of it, of it is, but we have appendices that are not appendices to anything. Um, so as we've gone through and looked at that, we've actually said, where do these appendices fit? Some of them actually are probably standalone policies, which would go in that thousand series. Um, so we hope to find the appropriate home um, for all of those, which we hope will make it much easier for you as board members to find those things, much easier for the community uh, to see how we operate by following it through. Uh, but to Phil's point, uh, it, it will be a, a pretty substantial change, and I think we'll want to review that collectively as a whole body. Yeah. We also discussed about this that uh, several school districts across the state use this model. If you go to their websites, you can you can clearly see their ones yes. your 900s and their 1000 series, which yes. is completely unique to each yeah. district. That idea that uh, that policy manual is exhaustive is, is uh, uh, I think there's a recognition that it's not and that uh, individual districts have needs that aren't met with that. Thank you. Um, moving to the one action item this evening, um, is there, are there any questions to the, the proposed resolution? Yeah. Board docs is going extraordinarily slow, wow. just, I'm, just saying. I'm I finally was able to navigate to this item. Um, I can't get it to update. Uh, but I would entertain a motion around uh, the resolution, if anyone can get there and read it. <laughs> Uh, I move that we approve the resolution directing the advertisement for sale, approving electronic bidding procedures, and approving the official statement for general obligation bond series 2010. Second. Okay, I'm ready to vote. We're probably going to have to do. We'll do voice. Well, yeah, because I can't get in. Um, Hemingway. Yes. Yes. Yay. Brotlin. Yay. Godwin. Yay. Ressler? Yay. Icestone? Yay. And Clawson? Yay. All votes have been cast and the motion carries with all directors voting in favor. All righty. Um, we've got um, the director liaison report. Anything that directors would like to comment on? Well, I went to the uh, uh, elected officials discussion at uh, North Central and uh, was uh, Interested just to see how, how things go at that junior high. I had some experience with Southeast with my daughter and things like that. But it was interesting. Uh, there's some, it's a very nice building on an overcast day. Uh, the lights weren't on. There was a lot of ambient light coming in from the, 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 from the design. And, and I was on a second floor classroom and it was really kind of nice. And uh, uh, also had lunch there. And I uh, have to say that the uh, uh, cafeteria staff was extremely friendly and professional. and. Uh, it was a very good lunch. I wish I had taken uh, two chocolate milks. I just sure. took one. But uh, uh, it, it was uh, very nice. And uh, um, I thought that uh, the class that I was in, the students really uh, had some very good questions. And uh, um, it was a fun experience. And I encourage others to take advantage of those opportunities when you get to go out and uh, be where the rubber meets the road. Anything else folks would like to highlight? If not, oh, I oh, do. Please. Sorry. Um, I did go to the uh, Hoover PTO meeting um, the night of like, the last community input session. And just uh, it was an interesting meeting, and it was really well done. Uh, Amy led that. Uh, it was a transitions meeting, uh, so there was, what, 70, 75 people there, roughly. It was a full library. Um, but the staff, the principals from Man, uh, Lemmy, and Longfellow were there as well and kind of kicked off that process of how things are gonna um, move forward with uh, next year with Hoover closing and those students being uh, sent elsewhere. Um, so it was really well done. Um, Lemmy is having a meeting on the 27th, 28th, whatever the, Tuesday, whatever the Wednesday is after our next Tuesday meeting. Uh, where they will also be discussing um, some transition stuff there um, with their PTO and they have um, asked me to come uh, and anybody else uh, who would like to attend as a board member to, to that meeting as well. Okay. Um, thank you. I think we can go to agenda setting. I can't, oh, I can actually see. Let's see, 1127. 
Let me see if I can actually pull it up. I know that we've got the, the vote on uh, attendance area. Um, while it's loading, is there anything else that we want to try to make sure we cover? Are you in there, Steve? I'm working on it. I think I might be back. This might not be for that meeting, but We're one to keep in something to keep in mind is um, we had discussed this earlier uh, in the year, and it was brought up again at our um, work session at Northwest. Uh, with the equity committee, but I would like at some point to discuss the SIAC committee and the makeup of that and the uh, kind of the direction, what their goals are um, for that meeting, for that committee. So as we start to wrap up this attendance stuff, I just don't want that to get lost because that's an important piece. We have that on We have that on our list. We've actually been talking about that, so we'll be ready with that. And I apologize, I still can't get back in, so I can't see the agenda. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, Chase, Amy, and I have been working on, on that and have uh, initially scheduled some meetings in a, in a format and a, a group uh, to do some of that work we've talked about. So we'll be able to provide you an update whenever you'd like on that. Thank you. So thank you, Kim, for the hard copy of the proposed 27th agenda. Um, a uh, few presentations, the Equity Implemented Partnership Overview, the Annual Curriculum Review Report is on deck on the 27th. Um, action items include Program of Studies, Attendance Area, which we've noted, Request for Modified Supplemental State Aid for Dropout Prevention, uh, Resolution Regarding Receipt and Recommendation of Bids and Directing the Sale of GEO School Bonds, Series 2019, Resolution to Approve Application for Modified Supplemental Amounts of Increased Enrollment, Resolution to approve application for modified supplemental amounts for ELL instruction. Um, so that's what's on deck for the 27th. And then the work session that's been proposed on the 27th is attendance area. Uh, and also there's a student climate survey discussion. For the sake of discussion, could we add voluntary transfer? to the work session agenda. I, I feel some urgency that we need to have in writing the words that we're committing to yeah, families know. regarding the Weber uh, to horn transition specifically and any other changes um, that we're making. I, I think it would be helpful if they could see us actually um, have that on an agenda and see a draft of that. And if we need to discuss it before we have the draft, then that's, you know, we can do that. So you're talking about the meeting on the 27th? The work, work session. session. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. I think, that's, I think that's good. And we could get some proposed language before that and post it. Doesn't need to be at the board meeting. If we're going to vote on boundaries, does it not need to coincide with that piece? As a I feel like there needs to be some discussion before we actually take a vote on it. I'd, I'd like to see it first because... I mean, we're making a lot of changes. We're getting a lot of requests, and that'd be my thought. It, I, I, I feel that pain, but I, I think the pain of making the decision on the boundary and then going back and officially making the decision on what we're going to allow those families to do after the fact with us just saying, yeah, we're likely to do this or that is squishy at best, right? Like that, that's a hard thing for me to, to separate to do one before the other. In retrospect, other, but. we probably should have had it on a work session agenda tonight, um, but it's not on our agenda, so we can't discuss it okay. tonight. That's what I was trying. I can't get the agenda for tonight's work session up. I was checking to see if it was on there, and it's not. So. So um, the, would it be how about would it be possible to have that topic in a pre meeting work session Very good, Janet. before the Thank before the so. actual board meeting? Does that make sense? You know, what, say that again? Like if the meet if we had a meeting at five, five thirty before the meeting started just to cover that topic. <laughs> I mean if you want to get it in before the vote, because I know I understand what Sean's saying is you're gonna vote on something and then you're gonna come back with unknown are you going to vote on something with unknown language in it yeah i think um i mean is there a way that um as a part of we can talk about an exception as a part of our boundary discussion yeah, and I just mean, ha and then go, do that tonight they go hand in hand no 
I don't know. It's not on the agenda, so I, I don't know if we can. I think, I, think when you're, I think when you're talking about whether you attach that to Horn or leave it at Weber, I think part of that contextual discussion can be where you want students to go, and I think you can give me direction on language. If we can accomplish that tonight. Because that sounds so like a good, and I think we do, I think it's fantastic. more important to do it ahead of time um, and not and not just say, well, it's on the agenda and it's out there, but to actually, in our heads, because I know for me that would be an important part of it. Our intent, very, very clear, with specific language, Steve, that we would be asking to be put into the policy that could then be proposed and actually put out on board docs for the 27th, you know, very well in advance, even next week, right? I'm just... Right. So we will make our intentions clear around voluntary and transfer policy exceptions tonight. Then we can get draft uh, a proposed modif uh, a revised uh, transfer policy out uh, after we do agenda setting for the 27th uh, board meeting and work session. And we can choose if we wanted to have an action item on the 27th to modify um, the policy, uh, voluntary transfer policy, after we do the attendance area map vote. Yep. I think that's fine. And then if or we before. need to make, it, make, make any tweaks, we can, you know, always pass what we have and then put it on the agenda yeah. again. Yeah. Fair enough. Do, do, oh, do it after. Oh, because we wouldn't know. Right. Right. Never mind. Yeah. yeah. So, but in the 27th, we'll have, we're adding an action item on voluntary transfer policy modifications. It'll be after the intentions area vote. Okay. Okay. I guess, I, yeah, I would rather have it be there and us deciding we need to table it and not do it than to have it not there and we just I think can't. So. I think, and I, I, think, think, we, and I think we made our intentions clear at the community session last Thursday, but we need to see it codified. Yeah. yeah. So include it on the board agenda yes. for potential action yes. and as placeholder, leave it in the work session. Yes. Got it. Yeah, that's good. That was a good conversation. That was good to clear that up. Anything else around agendas? Uh, hearing none, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.